Um, this is a beautiful community college campus compared to the 120 degree in the middle of the city uh, community college that I went to, so I don't know why anyone would think that that was not the case. So, um, just for a minute or two, and I'm going to start my timer because I'm going to get us back on time. Are you ready? Um, uh, just for a primer, I wanted to give a couple of slides about starfish for anybody that may be starting implementation or not super sure about starfish and kind of where we came from. Just a little brief background around a couple of slides before we get into the presentation. So Starfish started back in 2008 as an early alert platform. This was before you had titles like VP of Student Success at Crafton Hills, right? And, and it was really a, a tool designed to let you know what students to help, right? It's, it's very reactive in nature. If a student fails a course, doesn't show up to a class, you know, you can do something about it, you can intervene about it. But at a community college, when you have a thousand to one um, student to counselor ratios, also, I'm gonna say counselor more times than advisor, and I have a, I have a promise for you. Um, if I say advisor, every time I say advisor, my boss, Howard Bell, who is a handsome gentleman that you saw there, he's the GM of Starfish, will buy you a drink for every time that I say advisor instead of counselor. Um, so that, that's my agreement with all of you in the room. I just heard twice. You're down two already. This is a big group. Um, so we realized right, along this pathway, you know, can we eliminate those obstacles before the students get to them, right? Can we help you know ahead of time what type of resources students are going to need? Um, and also, as the students um, manage their journey, can they be proactive about the resources they seek out to increase their momentum and their chances of success? And that was uh, layering in technology like Starfish Degree Plan, which you guys have essentially helped us um, expand on over the last uh, four years now, um, three years, three and a half years, uh, and then layering in predictive analytics, right? So that we get to this point where we say not only who to help, but how best to help them, and look at did it make a difference? Because when you talk about making super monumental change in this space, um, the type that we haven't seen in 50 years, that's really what you need. You need that chain of, of process improvement that says not only who do I help, how do I help them, um, but did it make a difference? Uh, and so we layer that in with all the things that we offer at Starfish already, um, you know, guided pathways, onboarding, um, analytics, um, everything that you see up there to really make it a holistic solution for, for institutions. And hopefully you'll get a uh, picture of that today as we go along. Um, so where are you, right? Um, one of the benefits that you have here, and, uh, and knowing that I did this for uh, about two years, you have hardworking advising staff. I've never seen an advisor or counselor. <laughs> Sorry. So I've never seen a counselor go, I don't want to help this student, right? Um, you may not know who to help or what resources you're going to need in that moment. You might have to have five screen open, screens open to advise a student at a given time. Um, but that counselor really wants to make a difference to that student. Uh, and you have a lot of data, right? And uh, the CIO from Purdue, um, I forget his name, Jerry something, always says you have data collected, but it's not connected. It sits there like gold in the ground. We know more than we ever wanted to know about some of these students, but we don't utilize that information in a positive way to really impact their, uh, their, their journey. Uh, and you have students who want to succeed. 90% of your students, every survey that ever comes out, 90% of your students that show up on campus think they're going to be successful. So why do less than 10% actually complete? Right? Um, so we do have a lot of positive momentum in our favor. But we have some really significant challenges too, right? We have changing uh, enrollment. We're not necessarily getting more students. Um, just the, as the population ages up, we actually have less students. And those students that are coming um, are different, right? In 1960, the high school graduation rate um, was really low. You had 8% of students going to college right out of high school. Now it's over 60%. Um, how can we make that kind of change in enrollment patterns translate to change in success at this uh, secondary uh, level? Um, you have funding restrictions. Is, who's getting more money? Okay, so no one. So no one's getting more money, right? So you're always constantly asked to do more with less. So what we don't want to do is right, reach out to you with this pre-configured plan that says, hey, you're going to do one of these nine things and it's going to work for you. Um, instead, what we want to do is take the 350 plus institutions that we have, of which you guys are now oh, over 10% of that, uh, and really leverage best practices, leverage our community, um, leverage the insights that you're getting on a daily basis to work on a plan that's right for you. So that's my speech about Starfish in general. Um, now I'm going to tell you a story. Everyone loves stories. Um, some of you have seen this already, so you'll bear with me for the second time. Hopefully I'll be better at it this, the second time around than I was the first time. But I want you to meet our student. This is Julian. Um, Julian's the oldest of six, uh, and ever since high school he's worked three jobs. 
Uh, he's waited tables, served as a neighborhood handyman, and picked up odd construction jobs here and there. Um, and that's to help his uh, mother and his five siblings out. So recently, Julian ran into an old friend from high school, Gus, uh, who was actually celebrating a new job. He got a job at the local hospital, making more than Julian was making at his three jobs combined. He was able to do this by getting an associate's degree from the local community college. Now, Julian had thought about college, um, but he always thought that it was out of reach due to his lack of uh, financial stability in his home, and he didn't think that he would be able to afford it. Um, so Gus told him about a scholarship that he was able to get uh, at the local community college and a financial aid package that made uh, tuition not only affordable, but ensured that he could keep working while he was attending school. So Julian made a resolution that on his next day off, he was going to go into the local community college, Succeed Community College, and find out more. So when Julian walks in to Succeed, um, he's meted with his, uh, he's meted by his enrollment counselor, um, <laughs> Helen Coleman. And so Helen is a counselor at Succeed, and so she's used to meeting with students, um, helping them navigate the registration and application process, talking to them about financial aid, um, and assuring them that they'll be successful on their journey. So ever since Helen's campus uh, started using Starfish, she can quickly create a prospective student record to document her meetings. So with prospective students, um, you simply click on the prospective student option. So she clicks on the prospective student, um, puts in the student's name, uh, email, and birth date, and searches for a student record. Since there were no matches found, Julian's never actually been to the campus before, um, she's able to quickly click the create button and immediately create a new student record for Julian. A lot of clicks there. So, so you guys are mostly Starfish users, so you've seen the appointment screen before, but she's able to fill in um, where this meeting took place, um, the reason for the meeting, in this case enrollment assistance, uh, and that information is automatically shared across your campus through a, uh, uh, an intricate role and permission structure right, that you can set up that says, who has visibility to see this appointment, right? So when Helen actually talks to Julian, and they have a great discussion about the possibilities of enrolling. Um, he wants to know about the Colorado Hope Scholarship, um, and he rec she recommends that he go meet with a financial counselor um, to discuss his financial aid options, check some speed notes off to ensure that everyone can see uh, what they discuss. That information is immediately cascaded over to the financial counselor so that when Julian walks down the hall to meet with the financial counselor, he doesn't have to tell his story over again. So Julian's appointment with Helen gave him some great information, and he's taken that first step um, towards changing his life and the lives of his family members. So a few weeks later, Julian is excited. He receives um, notice of his uh, acceptance uh, into Succeed Community College, um, as well as uh, a notification of the next steps that he needs to take to get started at the institution. I have a lack of dexterity in clicking this mouse. You have a really fast mouse. Um, Warren, call him out. So here's, so here's Julian's enrollment confirmation. It outlines three steps for Julian to get started as part of his onboarding process. The first step is taking a career assessment. Now you guys are going to be now the second group from California and really uh, one of the very few to actually see what we're working on. Um, this is an integration with our partner, um, Perrin. Um, who actually provides career assessment um, and uh, uh, career exploration options, uh, student self-assessment career options within Starfish directly. So we're working on integrating this um, over the summer. Now the good news is, um, I know you guys mostly have a state contract with EMSI, so we're building this out to be extensible. So as long as you collect things like, B, uh, like zip codes or BLS data, if you bring that into Starfish, the pathway we can still construct can include that data as well. But I'm going to show you what we're working on. So hopefully you'll all be able to hear this. Warren, I tried to unmute here, but I didn't. I was not successful. No sound. All right, so he left. So I'm just gonna skip. I gotta do a little dance while the video plays. Um, no. So essentially, I'll. I'll ooh, I, you know what I bet I can do? I bet I can narrate this. I've seen it so many times. We're gonna try this out. This is the first time ever. All right. Here we go. Uh, selecting oh, okay. ideal career paths based on transferable skills that he's developed. All right, let's back this up since you guys missed it. Very happy. Right. Yeah. Experiences to design. There we go. The library generally goes to the Parent Pathway site and uploads his most recent resume. He can review his work experience as a restaurant server, a handyman, and construction worker. He can make corrections at any time 
while he's in the screen or come back later at another time. His resume didn't have his volunteer work experience at the local food pantry. So he has that experience now. He put job title, company, and city, how long he worked there, and also a description. This information will be used in the future for creation of a resume as well as for the process of selecting ideal career paths based on transferable skills that he's developed over time. Baron captures this information to align his soft and hard skills he has built through all of his work experiences to design new career paths. After he's entered his experience, Julian proceeds on to the next step, the parent survey. Julian takes a short parent soft skills assessment, which only takes seven to 10 minutes to complete. There's an audio function which pronounces each word and reads a definition for him, making him feel confident his results will be accurate. Not only are there five languages available online, but the parent assessment is the most comprehensive soft skills assessment available, measuring 102 soft skills and mindsets. He's now ready to submit his survey and proceed to the next step, which is career exploration. Julian sees that there's three ways to select a career pathway, to see hot jobs in his area, to search on specific jobs, or because he's intrigued with the ability to search other careers he may do get matched for, based on the information provided and results from the assessments, he selects find a career option and discovers, at that point, an interest survey. He selects things that yeah, he loves doing and things that he doesn't love doing. And he quickly realizes that this is an enjoyable journey and finds it very interactive and fun. But let's fast forward to where Julian completes the entire survey and he moves on to the next phase. After completing the interest survey, Julian sees other filter options. For now, he mainly wants to make sure he's able to stay in the Denver area so he can be close to his family. Julian is excited to find he's already a good match for becoming an engineer, as well as being well suited for some careers he's never considered, such as working in software quality assurance and also being an electrician helper, which might be a great first step in becoming an engineer. Although the other careers are interesting, Julian is set on becoming an engineer. So he goes back to the search careers feature to begin learning more about his dream job. He plugs in engineering and is quickly on his way to exploring what duties and activities are associated with an engineer. Julian finds himself drawn from the mechanical engineering option and looks for more details. He peruses the median salary and job outlook for the next 10 years. He also reviews his readiness and opportunity score. The readiness score is how prepared you are for the job right now. It includes soft skills of proficiency, the education that you report, and the hard skills that are transferable from other jobs. The opportunity score is the future quality of this job based on the total jobs available, the projected growth over time, average starting salary, etc. Excited about what he might discover, Julian selects Get Started for his career path. Julian is happy with what he has learned and starts his pathway. Instantly, he sees an estimated time it will take to achieve his goal, percent readiness score, and level of difficulty, which factors in the job market outlook for engineers. This personalized career path has taken into account all his information, such as the parent assessment, interest survey, work history, and education. As Julian scrolls down, he sees a starting point in his top four soft skills on the parent survey. As he continues, he sees in more detail about engineering education options and what an associate's degree will pay. He also explores what he could earn with a bachelor's degree. This motivates Julian to expand his dream and maybe even go for a bachelor's degree. Julian continues to scroll down to see the rest of his pathway, which includes an intermediate job as well as his dream destination, a mechanical engineer. He chooses to meet with Helen at the enrollment center and is excited to show her what he has learned and how he can get started with this path. Perfect. All right. So next, Julian completes the student intake form um, to provide additional context for the college. So you can see that he, from the profile screen, selects intake. Now, traditionally, information like access to technology resources or public transportation, the fact that Julian's a primary caregiver or that he works 30 plus hours a week might be lost on sticky notes or in a manila folder somewhere. Um, but with the student intake form, what you're able to do is configure that uh, intake process such that you can collect that information that might be um, predictive of the student's retention that is perhaps lost in the application process or isn't in your student information system today. 
today. And luckily we have the folks from NWTC here who are going to talk to you uh, about Starfish, I believe, tomorrow. And they are power users of the intake form, if I might say. So um, you, you have someone you can reach out to that's already an expert in using this information. Um, so Julian uh, fills out this information, and we use that information later to, um, to structure the cohorts that he's placed in that will provide him with resources that are applicable to his need. All right, so the last step for Julian if I can click the next button, uh, is uh, using that information from the parent pathways assessment to create an academic plan um, that he can use to discuss with his counselor. I'm gonna emphasize counselor every time I say it now too. Um, so we see that he's, we've already filled out the engineering piece um, because that was an applicable program to him. And you guys um, that are familiar with um, Surface Degree Planner know that there's some advanced settings as well. So preferences to take into account um, his work commitments or his family commitments, um, the number of credit hours or the time that he's available for classes. All this is configurable as well, meaning if I put 15, uh, a program like 15 to finish together at my campus and I put a default credit of 15 per program, then it'll automatically default them into 15 credits. So there's some ways that you can construct this that um, will be beneficial for the student that I'll talk about a little later as well. So for now, he simply selects engineering, clicks build plan, and now behind the scenes, the system is uh, prioritizing Julian's preferences um, to build his personal pathway to completion, right? So that includes information like um, his credit preferences, any prior credits or coursework or transfer credits, um, and his schedule. Uh, and it takes into account the institution's uh, requirements as well, so um, prereqs, co-recs, um, course sequencing, and availability. And what it does is build him a pathway, start to finish, path of least resistance, right? Um, and Julian can explore the courses that he's taking each term. Uh, in this case, he's actually excited that he gets an engineering course in his first term. He has some general electives, but he actually gets into engineering right away. One of the foundational principles of CCA, Complete College of America, is that uh, if you take at least nine credits in your first year in your discipline, you're 50% more likely to finish your program. So I would encourage you, if you're not structuring those items that way, it's really good to get them started in those uh, disciplines early. Julian also sees um, that he's, uh, he actually finishes his program in just under two years. So he's excited about the opportunity to actually get a new job and get started in just under two years. Now along this um, pathway, Julian realizes that uh, when viewing his schedule that he actually isn't available on Wednesdays. He has to take care of his brothers and sisters. He forgot to put that into the degree planner. So what he can quickly do is reschedule his courses, um, uncheck the Wednesday box, and he'll immediately be met with schedule options that are appropriate to his need. Um, he can scroll down on the right hand side there and see additional options and just by hovering over one and clicking set as schedule, um, that will actually set that as his new schedule and change those course sections out within his plan. So Julian's excited uh, about his plan, he feels good about it, he knows that it accommodates his schedule and his needs, um, he's excited to get started in an engineering course right away, so he requests approval to his counselor, um, Helen, uh, and sends that over her way. Now if you remember, his last step in the uh, process, uh, onboarding process was to schedule a meeting um, with his counselor, Helen. So you can see Helen's uh, bright, shiny face there. Um, he can simply click schedule appointment, and he's immediately met with the options available for him to schedule an appointment. Um, now this is integrated with Helen's Outlook or Google Calendar as well. Uh, so if we uh, need to, you know, she, Helen's got a standing appointment or she takes lunch at a certain time every day, um, that, all that information is automatically looked at behind the scenes and we're immediately met with spaces that are open for, for Helen. So Julian selects one. The reason that he's actually um, requesting the meeting, he's ready to go, he wants to get registered. Uh, and then the duration and the other items are auto-filled based on that appointment type and that's also configurable for you. And there you can see confirmation of Julian's appointment. So when Julian shows, uh, when Julian's counselor, Helen, prepares for the meeting with them, she's given access to a student folder with key information um, from the student information system, from the intake process, from the learning management system. Uh, so in this case, you can see some of his course averages, if he was an already enrolled student, um, but also some in information from our predictive analytics tool set, which include uh, things that might actually be helping him along the way, the fact that he's a full-time student, and things that might be weighing down his likelihood of success at the institution. Um, for example, that he's 20, almost 28 years old when entering the institution. 
For all new first generation students, Succeed has actually created a guided plan to really ease their transition into college. We call them success plans. Success plan is just a collection of to-dos, um, referrals, appointments that you're going to put a student through as part of a process. So you can do that for onboarding, you can do that for academic probation, you can do that for a host of different things. In this case, um, the collection of, uh, of events is from the New Shark Success Plan. Uh, and you can see that uh, some of the things he's already done, um, like creating an academic plan, uh, but he also needs to attend a new student advisement session, um, do a financial aid review, and sign and tactical things, like sign his actual financial aid repayment form, which some students forget to do. There's also due dates there, so if the due date passes and Julian hasn't completed those items, we can ramp um, interventions to actually reach out to him and the, uh, the counselor to let them know. So the uh, last step in Julian's appointment is uh, Helen uh, reviewing Julian's academic plan with him. So Helen has the same view to the academic plan as Julian, so it's ensured that they're always in sync uh, on what courses he's taking, what his schedule looks like, um, and Helen can interact with the plan the same as Julian and move courses across term to term um, and see downstream impact on Julian's progression. There's also a configurable approval process. Um, so plans can be approved term by term for students that need high touch um, or uh, registration assistance, but plans can also be approved for the entirety of the term so long as the student doesn't deviate from their plan. Uh, so in this case, uh, Helen believes Julian's plan looks good as long as he stays on track. Um, she doesn't need to meet with him over and over again. He can continue on his plan. So she approves the plan uh, through the end of the last term, summer of 2019. So with an approved plan in place, Julian can now register for his courses. And this is actually something that we're going to be working with a couple of California schools on um, to, to release uh, in pilot in spring. So here is, yeah, right? Okay, yeah. I was hoping we'd get some, some, some positive momentum out of that one. Um, so you can see that actually he sees within his plan that registration is now open. Um, he simply clicks the register for available courses link. Uh, the system behind the scenes actually uh, requests registration from the student information system itself. Um, and now you can see that he's actually successfully registered for his courses. This is different than many of the other vendors and things that you see in this space, which is that it is not a shopping cart. It doesn't make him go over to another system to actually complete the process. It all happens natively within one system. So I heard Rhonda speak earlier about how important it was and that students don't actually care about which technology they're interacting with. This keeps them in a seamless process through the entirety of the system. So together, the career assessment, the student intake form, and the success plan actually really helped Julian better understand his career aspirations, his hopes, his dreams, as well as his obligations and commitments to being a full-time student. So now with the plan for school all mapped out, Julian can really see a pathway to becoming uh, an engineer. He's already thinking about building bigger and better structures. He might even build his mom a house one day. So a few weeks into the semester, um, life happens. Um, and Julian's mom begins to struggle with her health. He begins to miss classes to take care of her uh, and his brothers and sisters. Subsequently, he starts to miss assignments, not showing up for class, um, including a major project in his English composition class. He receives an automatic notification from his school. And maybe this will get applause, we'll see. Um, this is our mobile view, uh, our mobile first view of the actual student experience that will be in your test tenants in February. So, uh, you'll be able to try it out, give us feedback, um, give us thoughts and ideas, and then the actual appointment scheduling piece um, we'll work on, and that will actually be out in the summer. So we're, we would love all of you to test this out. We're giving it to everyone ahead of time, so you'll have it in your test tenants to be able to, to, to look at. But what you can see is that it's really optimized for the device that Julian's on, which is usually his phone. Um, so he sees that reminder letting him know he's off track from his, uh, oh, no, that's the wrong thing. So you can see that we actually raise an automatic flag, but what we did in this case is we actually structured resources that were likely to help Julian based on that information that we learned about him earlier in the process. So, for example, we gave him family care services, and with our new mobile first design, which is a little cut off on the right hand side of that screen, um, he can actually schedule those resources directly from his phone. So Julian actually gets the help he needs um, through the community and child care services, but with the ad drop date fast approaching, um, he's worried he won't be able to catch up in time, and he withdraws from his English course. So the withdrawal triggers an actual notifica another notification to Julian and his advisor. The change is actually taking him off track for his plan, and he needs to um, get back on track uh, to, towards his uh, degree plan. Sometimes this button works, and sometimes it doesn't. All right. 
Um, so Julian logs in, uh, into Starfish, and you can see the um, scholarship course withdrawals flag that was raised on him over there on the right-hand side. Um, he needs to reconfigure uh, his plan. Now, I know this probably doesn't happen at any of your colleges, um, but Julian's initial thought is maybe I'm not an engineering student after all. Um, maybe um, I'm a different kind of student. Maybe I would like to take, let's say, physics. So Julian creates another plan with physics in his program, as his program of study, and immediately sees that not only does it take him a lot longer to complete that plan, uh, but it's a lot more math than he was planning on taking. Um, and so he is not excited about this idea at all. So instead, Julian decides that he's going to um, correct his existing plan, um, his engineering plan. So now, while Julian could actually reorder all of these courses um, and put them back into a structure that makes sense, um, what we're working on alongside our, our course registration is the automatic plan calculation feature. Um, so Julian can simply click um, see how we can update your plan automatically, and it will immediately restructure his plan, um, similar to like a GPS, and reroute him to the path to, to, to completion that is um, path of least resistance, right? What gets me out of here the soonest? So Julian updates his plan, and he gets back on track. And he works start hard to uh, stay on top of his classwork, and he's, his professors are even noticing. Uh, a few of them even send him a kudos through Starfish. Uh, and then about halfway through his program, um, Julian receives a message letting him know that he's actually close to earning a certificate, um, and that with little uh, additional work, he could actually have a certificate in hand, and it might help him actually get a better job now. Um, so he's encouraged to Where did my mouse go? Oh, there it is. So he's encouraged to uh, log into Degree Planner and look at um, adding the certificate to his program. This is, again, something that in our fruitful relationship with the California Community College is working on a close to completion report. Um, and so I told uh, Elise, who's on my team, that I wouldn't promise a date, but I'm just going to say soon you'll have access to a close to completion report um, that you can utilize to actually proactively reach out to students that might be close to completing a certificate or a program that they weren't aware of um, based on the requirements. Of the so Helen reaches out to Julian, lets him know about adding the certificate, and also encourages him to explore uh, careers that he might, or jobs that he might be suitable for once he uh, completes that certificate. So Julian uh, goes into Degree Planner, um, selects a certificate in engineering, and looks at the impact uh, on his plan. Not only does it see that it doesn't actually take him any longer to complete the plan, but he'll actually be done by completing one extra course uh, in fall of 2018, allowing him to get a job that will better help him um, along his pathway sooner. So he decides to log into the Parent Pathways portal and look at what jobs he would be eligible for um, with his certificate in hand. Super accurate, I think is the problem. Okay. Julian returns to his parent pathway. Although he's still not ready for his dream job, he's now qualified for an entry level electrician helper job where he'll be able to grow his engineering experience while still pursuing his associate's degree. Julian selects explore jobs and sees a number of open positions and selects one in the city. He's immediately taken to the job opening where he can apply for the position. So the parent Hobson solution not only allows you to imagine a future career, it also connects you to actual positions along that path. And Julian can actually see the progress towards each of his uh, programs, the Certificate in Engineering and the Associate's Degree, directly in um, Starfish. So with his certificate in hand, Julian lands that job at the big engineering firm, making a lot more than he was making before, all while finishing his Associate's Degree. He plans to continue on to a four-year uh, school to get his bachelor's degree, and his company might even help him pay for it. Now when his brothers and sisters go to college, they won't be able to say that they're the first. And scene, that's Julian's story. <laughs> so
So um, we really love the Julian story, but one of the challenges that you run into as an institution, and as a state, and a district, and um, you know, a, a collection of community colleges in terms of the size is there was a lot of work to get to that story, right? There was a lot of people behind the scenes that we really needed to actually um, be thoughtful, to have data, to construct and, and configure the system. And so this is that story. It's the prequel, um, never as good as the original, um, but it's another story about um, our vice president of success at Succeed Community College, Dr. Veronica Moore. And Dr. Moore um, started at Succeed Community College uh, about two years before Julie ever showed up. And before her boxes were even unpacked, she knew she had a mountain of work ahead of her. The school had seen continuous changes in enrollment patterns. Um, they had uh, a reactionary approach to student success. Um, and she was really brought in to change that culture. Um, and she knew that would be hard. So, all right, maybe I'll just use this. There we go. All right. So Dr. Moore knew that she would face some significant skepticism about cultural change and campus adoption would really be critical to making sure that, um, that, that, that she were su successful in her work. Um, and you know, I don't want to steal Beth Davis's thunder. She's going to be talking to you a lot about cultural change and how to work that within Starfish. Um, but uh, one of the things that she did was she met with her team, right? And she heard from IT that we have too many technologies, we have initiative 15, we don't have enough resources to support another technology. Um, she heard uh, from faculty that we had a different quality of student um, and that they weren't going to dumb down their teaching or rigor for the students that were coming on campus today. Um, she heard from counselors that they were doing a great job of triaging students, but they were really reactionary. They weren't proactively reaching out to really make a difference in student success. So she was trying to understand their perspective and their concerns and really better um, you know, understand where they, were, where they were coming from so that she could reach them. So she reaches out to, I swear, okay, a little bit more, um, to succeed strategic consultant, um, Nick James, uh, who is a combination of two people that I work with on a regular basis, um, who recommended a readiness assessment and capacity planning workshop to assist the campus through that work needed to really better assist the students that succeed. And I think you're gonna get a, a little bit of a preview of that tomorrow. Um, so the workshop really began to take Dr. Moore's conversation to the next level. It brought together an institutional working group, um, similar to what you guys are doing here, I'm in at your campuses, to really analyze what you're doing today, historical trends, and uncover ins insights with the data that they already had, but didn't know what to do with. And the last step of that was to build a strategic plan um, that worked for the institution. And they came up with four key areas of focus. So first was breaking down the information silo. Um, the institution was really able to identify a great number of amazing initiatives across the campus, but each department, college, student group, and service was using their own way of capturing and sharing data, sharing information across the campus, or the system was a, was a no-go. Um, and it was really challenging to understand how to triage and help a student holistically. The next was um, examining institutional trends. Um, so everyone on campus saw the obvious. Non-traditional students were growing each year, um, that was the new normal, but really aligning that to the goals of the institution was becoming a real challenge for, for them. How do we know what resources that we have um, to really meet those students was the next challenge. How do we align our student success resources to the population that exists today and not the population of even three or four years ago, which might not be the same anymore. And then lastly is streamlining that student journey. Um, students don't care how many technologies they're interact at, interacting with or what your process is behind the scenes to them paying their key deposit before they can get started. They really just want a streamlined journey and understanding of the next step that they can take to really uh, impact their completion. All right, so starting with um, breaking down information silos. So with guidance from Star, the Starfish team, uh, SEC felt like they had a plan to really address those challenges. But first they had to find a way to share that information strategically across um, academic and student affairs alike. All right. So Starfish took the data from a myriad of solutions across Succeed's campus and put it into a unified place with a configurable rolling permission structure to really ensure Succeed can provide access to the right data, to the right people, at the right time. So this is an example of the student folder that's merging all of that data together, including predictive risk score, um, so, you know, phone number, your students. But as you open up the student folder, that data becomes even more rich. 
um, and information from that sys, LMS, and other systems actually combined with that Starfish data, so the appointments, the intake process, to really provide a holistic look at Julian. And that data is layered through with predictive analytics to provide additional context such as risk factors, um, momentum, engagement with resources on campus, and academic performance. So now that SEED has access to admissions, advising, and academic performance information all in one place, if a student has a conversation with that admissions office, um, they don't have to repeat themselves when they show up at the financial aid office. Additionally, everyone across campus can be provided pertinent information to make those connections to resources that best serve the student. So that's, the, that's some, some CIS data, some of the cohorts that we uh, place student in, as, uh, the student in, as well as the student intake data. And here is the actual example of an LMS integration that shows performance on courses and on a particular assignments directly within Starfish. So now that SCC was really per positioned to share information across the campus, they had to determine where to apply their efforts to really get focused. So with an effective tool uh, in place to share information across the campus, Dr. Moore and team really wanted to un uncover which hotspots existed within the student population so they could begin that pro pro uh, process of focusing her team's effort. Um, so working with Nick, they found several areas of emphasis where Succeed could make a significant impact. Um, students with withdrawals, underrepresented minorities, non-traditional students, first-year students, um, and Pell or scholarship eligible students, and students um, by varying ages. So before she could put an effective plan in place, um, Dr. Moore really had to know where the institution was today. And this is an example of our benchmarks report. So this takes 10 years of historical data and really aligns it to how you're performing against your entire student population and then a filtered population, as well as against other institutions that are like you. Um, so with that information, um, there might be areas to celebrate. Say you're not where you want to be with first generation African American students who are Pell eligible. They're below benchmark for the rest of your institution, but ahead of your peers. That might be a really good um, moment to pause and say, hey, we're actually doing some really great thing with this pop things with pop this population. We really just need to scale our resources to keep that momentum and that upward trend going. Um, but you might uncover gaps too, right? Um, and as we drill into this uh, benchmark report here, we're going to hone in on a few key areas, which include male students um, who are uh, Pell eligible, um, who are Hispanic. And what we'll see is they actually perform um, below benchmark compared to their peers at the institution, um, starting at about six credits. So once they complete six credits or more, um, their trajectory is lower than, uh, than their peers. So that's really good to know those historical trends. It can eliminate the conjecture of like, I think we have a gender gap problem in STEM, um, or I think the students in this program perform better because they're this particular demographic. It can eliminate a lot of that with, the, with that uh, population. However, there are students on campus today that we need to help. And so our, uh, um, our <clears throat> student explorer report actually takes that uh, information and makes it predictive. What are the students on campus today predicted to do versus their peers? So when we filter that information down, we created a bookmark for our uh, Pell eligible Hispanic men, um, which is a burgeoning population in the Denver area. And what we can see is they actually perform, uh, are predicted to perform at a lower rate than their peers um, across four measures. Um, one is retention, are they gonna come back term over term? Uh, another is uh, velocity, um, their uh, velocity towards completing their program versus prior completers. Um, their credit ratio, taken versus completed, uh, and their GPA. So what are those key stats about the students that are really impacting the retention? So working with um, Nick, they segment that information out to see some of the items that you see here, which is that male students uh, are performing below female students, um, that Pell eligible students are performing below um, non-Pell eligible students, um, Hispanics have the harder uh, road uh, versus their, their peers. Uh, from a demographic perspective. So we really want to take this information um, and now take it a little bit further, right? To say, what is the makeup of those actual students? What are the specific factors that are impacting their retention? And how can I weight those things to see where I should intervene? Um, so this is an example of our retention predictors report, and it's going to be kind of an eye chart there on the left-hand side. Um, but what there are that I'll read off to you is no velocity, right? So the student's not completing any credits in a term that they took uh, courses in. Um, low ongoing GPA, a uh, GPA of less than two. Um, the fact that they're a first year student, they have a low credit ratio. The fact that they started in Q4 versus Q2. Um, so there's some really good information and what this 
allows you to do is not be black box with predictive analytics. If you want to look at the specific things that are impacting your student's retention on campus, you can look at the specific factors and the makeup of that model that is impacting your student's success. Um, so there's one that, that you can see a little bit better, which is first year students. Um, and those are a combination of factors. Um, there's characteristics, right? Things that they can't change, that they're inherently coming into the institution with. Um, things like a uh, first-time student. Can't change that. I'm going to be a first-time student. But there's also behaviors, things like course withdrawals, um, that we want to control for as well as part of our intervention strategy. So Dr. Moore works with her team and creates really specific targeted cohorts um, to tailor those intervention strategies that she's going to make uh, moving forward. So this is an example of creation of a cohort. Um, and you can see we have a lot of different cohorts in there that are targeted at specific risk populations. Uh, in this case, we're going to look at first year students um, with greater than one course withdrawal and a retention um, per, uh, likelihood of less than 50%. Um, so anytime a first year student uh, withdraws from a course and they're 50% likely to not come back next term, um, we want to do something. And so there is the cohort creator and kind of how you structure all of that information in one place. Uh, and now that cohort is actually created within Starfish. So, so far, Dr. Moore and team have built that structure to ensure everyone has a holistic picture of the student. And we've identified a particular risky cohort of students um, that we want to help. Um, we've also uncovered some factors that will likely impede their success along the way, um, such as a slow start, not completing their attempted credits, as well as course, course withdrawals. The next question becomes what to do with that information. What works for this cohort of students as a success strategy? So to start, Dr. Martin really need to know what they're doing today. Uh, I'm not the, I don't want to be the host of this meeting. Sorry, I should have Sorry. I don't want the, uh, we're videotaping this. I'm not going to be able to escape it, no matter what happens. <laughs> Um, so to start, Dr. Martin really need to know what they're doing today, right? And this is an example of our intervention inventory. I mean, you can see those learner characteristics and behaviors are factors uh, along the timeline of continu or continuum of student success um, at, at an institution, right? So this is a framework from the Completion by Design uh, work out of the Gates Foundation to say, you should have intervention strategies at connection, when you first interact with a student, when they enter your institution, um, as they're progressing towards their uh, degree or certificate, um, and then also at completion, when they're about 80% or more done, um, you need to have intervention strategies along that continuum. So it really gives you an opportunity to look at this in a more strategic way. Um, I, get, I guess if I asked any one of you in this room, you couldn't tell me all of the things that you're doing for student success at your institution. But if I gather you all together, right, and we look at these things and put them in a framework that's holistically looking at student success at, at your college, it becomes a much more powerful tool. Hey, Richard? Yes, ma'am? Yeah, let me grab that. There, out of your way. Don't say I never gave you anything, Becky. <laughs> um, so this is really where the rubber meets the road. Um, they find that they already have several dozen interventions for first-time students. Many are duplicating efforts, and some are for a population or program that doesn't even exist anymore at their campus. Have you ever had that conversation before? So with the intervention inventory completed, Dr. Moore looks at all those supports related to her new risk co cohort she's created. Not only can she see all of the interventions at Succeed that they're putting into place to support this group of students, um, but with intervention sharing, she can also review what other successful institutions are doing to address those same concerns. So Dr. Moore is able to rally this team at Succeed around this idea, and, and Succeed creates that initial success plan for their uh, first cohort of students, leveraging existing resources as well as some new ideas from the community. Succeed also creates flags for risky behaviors such as course withdrawals, missing initial assignments in the first term, or changing majors. The team uh, at Succeed also wants to ensure that they focus on positive behaviors to reinforce student momentum, so they set some guidelines on kudos creation. And with those resources actually created as services within Starfish, all students will have access to them directly within Starfish. It eliminates a student coming to you and saying, for the first time ever, I'm sure, I didn't even know we had a Veterans Resource Center. I didn't even know that we had a textbook scholarship program. 
And this is an example of creating uh, a flag for that particular risky behavior. In this, did, in this case, we did the scholarship course withdrawals. So anytime a student's on a scholarship or on financial aid, we're gonna raise a flag. And there's some immediate information that you can use to kind of triage these behaviors too, right? Um, I can say this is a critical item, meaning it'll bubble up to the top of the counselor or the student's list. Or I can say that this is an emergency notification, in which case as soon as the, it, the thing happens, it will immediately be sent out to, um, to whomever's responsible for that at the institution. I can limit that to the specific cohorts I created earlier. So I might not want to intervene every time a student misses the first day of class, but if a student's in a particular risky population, I might want to intervene every time they miss the first day of class. It really allows you to scale your resources to meet the students that are most in need of your help. And this is an example of kudos uh, uh, creation as well, and you can also target those in specific cohorts. So you might want to build more positive reinforcement or momentum for a certain group of students. Who's using kudos today? Is anybody using no? Wow, a lot of people. Holy cow, we have a kudos expert user group here. So now with a set of resources dedicated to those specific student risk factors and tailored to the cohort's specific needs, Dr. Moore and team want to know what can be done to streamline that student journey through the creation of a better and more holistic student experience. Um, so, what she, in that work that she did with Nick James and the Starfish team, they uncovered a, partic a few particular places to intervene. Um, writing a uh, composition, so English courses, developmental education classes, engineering majors, physics majors, and certificate programs. So Dr. Moore uh, and team examined course outcomes for those STEM programs that we just talked about on their campus due to historic challenges with completion in this area. So through the Course Explorer, the Succeed team reviewed those courses by outcomes, uncovering college writing as a real obstacle reten to retention. Over a third of the students who don't obtain a C or better don't come back the next term. So with college uh, writing being mandatory for all programs, they ramped up their intervention tactics to include um, targeted help whenever a student falls behind in that particular course. Now when reviewing elective taking behavior, Dr. Moore and team uncovered some additional challenges. Since Succeed had fairly open electives, students in STEM programs were often choosing electives that they weren't successful in. So they could review success rates and impact of course taking behavior on STEM students. Um, the team was able to actually construct programs with electives and courses that had not only appealed to the STEM students, but that they were likely to be successful in. So in the example here, you see that students are actually far less likely to come back if they don't succeed in psychology than they are in chemistry. For engineering students, that might make sense since they're a little bit more analytical and a little bit more technical. But what we're able to do with that information is actually create a structure of STEM electives that provides them with choices that are appropriate to them and that they're likely to be successful in. However, with that information, offering more appropriate electives uh, per major type can result in some challenges regard, with regard to seed availability. So utilizing Starfish, the deans and Dr. Moore can not only see which classes had overloaded sections for the term, but project out that future course demand. Uh, additionally, they leveraged the heat map to help them better understand when students would be available to take courses. So within six months, Dr. Moore and the team at Succeed Community College had made a significant amount of progress towards transforming their campus. They identified a cohort of several thousand students who were at risk within their institution and tailored specific intervention strategies to meet those students' specific needs. They eliminated barriers such as obstacle courses, they scaled supports to meet the needs of not just the at-risk students, but all students, um, and they streamlined the student onboarding process, including new tools for self-assessment, career exploration, and registration, all within a single th threaded process. The leading returns were positive, and pretty soon, the new Shark Success Plan became a best practice to share with their peers. This motivated the Succeed team, and, was, uh, and Dr. Moore saw it as a positive when her team came to her and asked, what's next? So I had enough time. I debated with my team whether I was gonna have enough time for this. So uh, the reason that this is something that I aspire to, I've been doing this for 15 years now, working in student success and retention, um, and uh, that, that's very personal for me. Um, and I used to say 15 years and people would go, oh, but you look so young, and now that doesn't happen anymore. Um, <laughs> But this is my mom and me. Uh, I am about four years old in this picture. Um, my mom had me when she was 16. Um, we lived in Birmingham, Alabama, in one of the poorest uh, places in the country. Um, and she worked at a gas station and odd jobs during the day to, to care for me as a single mom. Um, but she went to a local community college in Alabama called Sneed State University. Um, and what she was able to do was actually take a few courses to learn how to solder uh, motherboards for computers.
This was in um, the early 80s. I'm not going to tell you how old I am. Um, but uh, it actually was able to get her a job during the day, not a night job, um, that she could use and, and she could um, make a better living and a better life for us, which was great. Except no one solders motherboards in the United States anymore. Those technical disciplines change really, really rapidly. Um, and so my mom had to continue to evolve, right? And so she went back after getting her GED and a few courses, um, got her licensure uh, for um, insurance, for selling insurance. And now that's what, what she does. Um, me, on the left-hand side, I went to a community college in Phoenix, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and I was really, really poor. We grew up really poor, and this was something that was a challenge for us. Um, and in my third semester, um, someone broke into my car and stole my books, including my graphing calculator, which is a thing that hopefully we never make students use anymore, but I imagine that we still do. <laughs> um, but they were really expensive. Um, and a TI-81, for the record. Um, and I did not have the money to replace those books or that, um, or that information. And I didn't know about financial aid. I had paid for, to register for class with my job that I worked at, um, and I dropped out. Um, luckily for me, I had a success network. I had people like you in this room that came back to me and told me about the importance of finishing college, went on to get two graduate degrees. And so this is something that we're passionate about. So if you talk to Kelly, which I'm sure you've all talked to Kelly, there's no one in this room that has not talked to Kelly before, or if you talk to Emily, or if you talk to Howard, or you talk to our team, this is something that we're passionate about because it's personal to us. When you look at research around grit um, and finding gritty students, that's when you really make a difference in momentum and in student success. So yes, shameless plug at the end by putting a baby picture up um, to get you all engaged, but I want you to know that we're here to partner with you because this is personal to us. This is something that we want to see every student that shows up at your campus achieve the goals that they set out, whether that's getting a certificate, whether that's taking a few courses to get a better job. We don't believe that any student that shows up at your institution deserves to go home. And that's something that we'll take and fight with you for um, in, at, throughout this partnership. So thank you for your time. so much, Richard. Um, we were really excited to have Richard come and share that presentation with you because it's so easy when you're implementing something really big at your campus to just focus on that one piece. And with this whole emphasis and the focus on trying to break down silos, it's really critical that we see the bigger picture and that we start thinking about it early on. So, um, so thanks again, Richard, for sharing that um, awesome presentation with us, being able to see it for the whole life cycle of the student and including the back end, that critical reporting process for us. Because we are moving towards outcomes-based funding and it's critical that we start thinking ahead. So thank you. Now, um, all right, everyone, so I'm sure at this point you're all ready to stretch your legs, right? Okay, so don't all get excited. So we have about a 15 minute break. So if you can all now migrate back to Crafton Hall, then we'll go ahead and get started at about 1045. Thank you.